This video presentation and its accompanying materials are copyrighted by the American Association for Respiratory Care, AARC. Any public display, sale, copy, or distribution of the video or materials may only be undertaken with the prior written consent of the AARC. As a registered participant, you are authorized to duplicate course materials for this program for each participant viewing at your facility. This presentation and accompanying materials can be used by staff within the institution, but cannot be resold, distributed, or displayed for profit. Copyright 2020. All rights reserved. The following is a presentation of the American Association for Respiratory Care. Welcome to Current Topics in Respiratory Care. Today's topic is Ventilator-Induced Lung Injury, Protecting the Lung. Neil McIntyre is the Medical Director of Respiratory Care Services and Professor of Pulmonary Medicine at Duke University Medical Center and Fellow of the AARC. Dr. McIntyre discloses he has relationships with Inspirex Pharmaceutical, Breathe Technology, and Ventec. Brand names of products and or medications may be mentioned only as examples of technology. Any use of brand names is not in any way meant to be an endorsement of a specific product, but to merely illustrate a point of emphasis and to provide information and education regarding the availability. Welcome to our discussion on ventilator-induced lung injury uh, with a focus on protecting the lung. So what I want to do is break my presentation up into two broad sections. First, I want to describe what we mean by ventilator-induced lung injury, what are the mechanisms, uh, and I want to focus on the notion of regional effects. Uh, because I think it plays an important uh, part in understanding how ventilator-induced lung injury actually develops. The second part of my presentation is going to be taking those concepts and taking it to the ICU and going to the bedside with the ventilator and the things we need to do to reduce ventilator-induced lung injury, to protect the lung. And uh, I also want to point out that oftentimes there are some trade-offs involved. So ventilator-induced lung injury, I think of as iatrogenic ARDS, that is ARDS uh, caused by us. ARDS is a, a broad descriptive term that describes uh, an alveolar capillary injury, and there's inflammation, there's edema formation, there's flooding, broken down surfactant, adjacent small airways dysfunction. All the things we associate with ARDS from sepsis, uh, pneumonias, trauma, things of that nature, this is all caused by us. So here's a little cartoon of a healthy alveolus, gas-filled. Uh, the, capillary the capillary is right adjacent to the alveolar capillary membrane. And this is an ARDS alveolus. It's flooded, uh, it's inflamed, there's capillary damage, there's surfactant damage. So again, think of ventilator-induced lung injury, or VILI, uh, as ARDS that is produced by us. In its simplest construct, Ventilator-induced lung injury is caused by excessive stretching of alveolar tissue, what engineers would call excessive strain. And there are three circumstances where we get this excessive strain. I've plotted here the uh, traditional, if you will, pr uh, pressure volume curve of the acutely injured lung. The light blue line describes the mechanical behavior. Uh, on the vertical axis is volume. On the horizontal axis is uh, transpulmonary pressure, the pressure across the alveolus. Engineers uh, describe this, uh, uh, this pressure volume uh, phenomenon in terms of stress and strain. Stress is the force applied to an object, uh, and strain is the distortion or the stretching of that object under stress. So again, transpulmonary pressure is the stress on, the, on, on alveolar tissues. Volume change is the strain on that uh, alveolar tissue. So if you look at this drawing, uh, you can see that there are probably three major mechanisms in play here. Let's start at the upper right, excessive maximal stretch. 
this is maximal stretch. This is often referred to as static strain. It's the strain on the system uh, at, at the end of a full breath. Uh, as I'll show you in a moment, the maximal transpulmonary pressure uh, in you and I is around 30 centimeters of water, and that's usually where the lung is maximally stretched. And if you go above that pressure, that transpulmonary pressure, you will cause excessive static strain and damage. In the middle is excessive tidal stretch. This is sometimes called dynamic strain. And this is usually associated with a tidal volume greater than eight mLs per kilogram ideal body weight in a normal subject. Excessive tidal stretch and excessive maximal stretch uh, act independently. You can be injured by one or the other or both. And the final mechanism is down at the bottom left. It's a collapse reopening strain. So it's alveoli that are collapsed and then are being popped open. And then with deflation, uh, they recollapse again. So the strain uh, uh, under these conditions is the strain of opening and closing rapidly. So stress and strain, and the three major mechanisms of injuring the lung, ventilator-induced lung injury. So let's look at number one, excessive maximal stretch or static strain. Look at the panel on the left. This is a summary of many, many studies, both in animals and humans, looking at transpulmonary pressure and injury on the vertical axis. And in all mammalian species, including man, uh, the maximal stretching pressure of the lung is right around 30 centimeters of water. So those of you watching this video, if you were to take a really deep breath right now, just completely fill your lungs, and I measured the pleural pressure uh, and the pressure across your alveolar structures, it would be about 30 centimeters of water. So 30 centimeters of water is the maximal stress the lung is designed to tolerate. On the right panel uh, are data from the ARDS network trial that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, looking at lung injury from stress and strain. And as you can see, uh, there's actually evidence here that uh, in an injured lung, uh, there may really not be a, a safe transpulmonary pressure, static pressure. The take home message here is that we really need to focus on the lung being below 30 and the injured lung perhaps even lower than that. Let's look at tidal stretch or dynamic strain. And again, I wanna point out that you can have excessive dynamic strain even in the absence of excessive static strain. In other words, a tidal volume that is excessive can cause harm even if the maximal stretching pressure on the lung is less than 30 centimeters of water. Let me show you some data that uh, I think illustrates these points. Uh, up at the top is a fascinating experiment done by uh, one of the real giants of our time, Ted Colabo. These were done back at the NIH. These were normal sheep. And what uh, Dr. Colabo did is he put a small catheter in the fourth ventricle of these sheep and dripped a small amount of acid, just a little bit. Now you all know that uh, the fourth ventricle is, is in the brainstem where the ventilatory control system is. And a little bit of acid there is enough to stimulate respirations. And in these normal sheep, Dr. Colabo got them to breathe in the neighborhood of nine to 15 mLs per kilogram. Now you notice the transpulmonary pressure uh, the, uh, at the end of inspiration, these are normal sheep, was only nine centimeters of water. So certainly not excessive static strain, but clearly excessive dynamic strain. And sure enough, after three days, uh, a third of these animals were dead, and almost all of them had clearly injured lungs. The control group also got a little bit of acid, but they were paralyzed and put on a ventilator so that they would not have big tidal volumes. And as you can see, they all survived the experiment just fine. The bottom panel is the ARDS network trial again. The yellow bars are the uh, small tidal volume group. The black bars, darker bars, are the large tidal volume group. And these are spread out, over, or, or these are broken into what are called quartiles. Quartiles is one quarter of the population. So the sickest 25% is on the right, the worst compliance, and the healthiest population, if you will, uh, with the best compliance is on the left. And what I want you to notice is the columns on the left, the best, because in these patients, uh, because the lungs were relatively uh, normal, not normal, but had uh, only minor lung injury, 
the, the plateau pressures, the end inspiratory pressures, were quite low, were quite low. Uh, and in fact, the plateau pressure in even the large tidal volume group was in the low 20s. So you would think safe, low transpulmonary pressures. But as you can see, as you can see, even when the transpulmonary pressures at maximal inflation were low, there was a benefit to having a reduced tidal volume as well. So my message here, again, to reemphasize, is that dynamic strain is just as important as static strain. And the final mechanism is this rapid reopening or opening and closing stretch or strain. And this is a, a little cartoon that uh, depicts sick or collapsed alveolus on, alveoli on the left and inflated alveoli on the right. And as the breath is delivered, right there at that interface, you can see incredible stretching going on. In fact, some have estimated these stretching pressures to be as high as 100 centimeters of water or more. So this is happening with every breath uh, where there is popping open of alveoli and collapse of alveoli. Lung injury is caused by excessive stress and strain. Ma excessive maximal strain occurs when the transpulmonary pressure is greater than 30. Dynamic strain is caused when the tidal volume in, in, in a normal lung is greater than eight mLs per kilogram of ideal body weight and collapse and reopening occurs when there is repetitive opening and collapsing of alveoli. The three major mechanisms of, uh, of lung stress and strain injury. With all three mechanisms, there's regional effects. Regional effects. When you apply a pressure down the endotracheal tube, that stress is delivered everywhere. But the strain, the strain is quite regional and depends heavily on regional mechanics. Put another way, you put a constant pressure into the lung, the regions with the best compliance and the best resistance are going to be inflated much more, much more than the regions with bad compliance and bad resistance. And that's illustrated on these two CT scans. As you can see on the left, there's considerable consolidation at the bases, uh, and much of the lung, much of the aerated lung is restricted to the very top of the lung. When you put positive pressure in this, uh, in this situation, the bottom half of the lung uh, is recruited and opened, but you'll notice what happens to the healthier region at the top of the lung. It gets grossly overinflated. And this typifies the problem we face in the ICU every day. Typifies the problem every day. We are constantly trying to balance these regional effects. We're constantly trying to make sure that we treat the sick lung as best we can without harming, without harming the more normal regions of the lung. So ventilator-induced lung injury, mechanisms of injury, and regional effects. So let's go to part two. Let's talk about how to manage this. So our first goal, our first goal is going to be eliminate excessive maximal stretch. So how do we do that? Well, I've already discussed this. We try to keep the transpulmonary pressure less than 30. If we uh, realize, or remember I should say, that pressure is distributed uniformly, this assures that no alveoli are exposed to excessive stretch. Now, I've been using this term transpulmonary pressure. Do we measure transpulmonary pressure? No, unfortunately, we usually don't. That would require some measurement of pleural pressure, uh, perhaps an esophageal balloon. And what do we do instead? We measure plateau pressure in the airway plateau pressure in the airway, the pressure at end inspiration under no flow conditions. Now, the problem with that is that pressure is being driven uh, uh, by both lung mechanics and chest wall mechanics. And remember, the injury is across the lung. So on the left cartoon there, I'm delivering 33 centimeters of water down the airway and at end inspiration with no flow, that's 33 centimeters inside the alveolus. In this example, the lung is stiff and injured and the chest wall is relatively compliant. As a consequence, the chest wall contributes very little to the actual pressure being measured. In this example, only five centimeters of water. The real driver of the plateau pressure here is the transpulmonary pressure across the lung of 28 centimeters of water, 33 minus five, 33 minus five. So if your chest wall 
is reasonably compliant, your plateau pressure, 33 in this example, is pretty darn close to the transpulmonary pressure, 28 in this example. And that's cool. It makes our job easy. Unfortunately, a lot of patients don't have normal chest walls. They may have tight surgical bandages. They may have some sort of uh, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. And of course, the big one in uh, the US today is obesity. And obesity can create very stiff chest walls, so much though that it can actually double uh, the plateau pressure for a given transpulmonary pressure. So we have to keep that in mind. Uh, ideally, we'd like to measure it. If we can't measure it, we at least need to take it into account in our, in, in our assessment of our patients. Um, so the patient with obesity or ch abnormal chest walls is on the right. Again, 33 centimeters of water there, uh, 33 centimeters of water in the alveoli. But in this example, uh, it's the stiff chest wall driving the pressure up in this example. You can see that the transpulmonary pressure is only eight centimeters of water because all of the pressure really is being used to distend the chest wall. So again, we can make estimates of what the pleural pressure is, but in thinking about goal number one, a limiting excessive maximal stretch, uh, we want to limit the transpulmonary pressure, maximal transpulmonary pressure, and we estimate that from our plateau pressure, taking into account the possibility that the chest wall may be complicating that measurement. How well are we doing? How well are we doing? This is a great study. Uh, it's a huge study uh, of several thousand patients on mechanical ventilators around the world. It's called the Lung Safe Study. And uh, it's basically a snapshot of what's going on in ICUs around the globe. Now, these investigators, for reasons I'm not clear on, uh, broke the uh, uh, regions of the world up. I don't think that makes much of a difference here, um, it, 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 at least in the message I think that uh, is important. And the message that I think is important here is you will notice that the vast majority of patients around the globe have plateau pressures less than 30 centimeters of water. So we're doing pretty darn well there. Yes, there is a smattering of patients uh, with plateau pressures between 30 and 35, but almost nobody goes above 35 centimeters of water. So for goal number one, limiting maximal static strain, limiting maximal transpulmonary pressure, uh, we're doing a pretty good job. We're doing a pretty good job. So let's look at goal number two, limiting excessive tidal stretch. Limiting excessive tidal stretch. So the physiologic normal tidal volume in you and I is somewhere around seven or so mLs per kilogram. In most studies that have looked at this, uh, the normal range is usually set between four and eight milliliters per kilogram. In you and I, that is a safe tidal volume. That is a safe tidal volume. So how are we doing on that one? Well, here's the lung safe study again. And we're not quite so good, are we? We're not quite so good. Yes, the majority of patients are getting tidal volumes less than eight mLs per kilogram, the ARGNET range of four to eight, but you'll notice there's a significant minority that's up in the eight to 10 range, and what's more worrisome, there's even a significant number of patients who are being exposed to above 10 and even above 12 centimeter, uh, mils per kilogram ideal body weight. So we got some work to do here. We've got some work to do here. We're good on plateau pressures. We're not so good on tidal volumes. So our goal, as I say, is to keep the tidal volume below 8 mLs per kilogram ideal body weight. Now think about that for a minute. This assumes, this assumes that your lungs, the baseline lungs, the functional residual capacity before the lungs are inflated is near normal. It's near normal. And obviously in you and I, that's a safe assumption. But what if it's not? What if it's not? So on the left is an injury that's not terribly severe, that yes, there's zatelectasis and infiltrates down at the bases of both lungs, but most of the lung is open and aerated. In this example, if we deliver a tidal volume, it's going to be distributed to about 80% of the lung. So if you deliver at the trachea, six mLs per kilogram ideal body weight, Effectively, in the functioning lung, that's about seven and a half milliliters per kilogram. And that's probably okay. But look what happens when the injury is more severe on the right. 
The tidal volume here is being distributed to only 22% of the lung, what Gattinoni refers to as the quote unquote baby lung. Do the math on this one. Well, now our six mLs per kilogram ideal body weight is equivalent in that small segment of the right anterior lung, it's equivalent to a tidal volume of 27 mLs per kilogram, grossly over distending the tidal uh, breath regionally. So this is a very, very important concept. How do we address this? How do we address this? How do we find a better way to scale tidal volume than ideal body weight, which is, again, assumes a normal lung? Well, there are some techniques out there. We haven't got time to go through all of them. Uh, the obvious one is a CT scan. That's how I was describing this phenomenon in the first place. But you and I do not have access to, ready access to CT scans to do on our patients every time we want to make a ventilator change. Uh, one of the interesting imaging techniques that's come along uh, and is not yet available in the United States, but probably will be in the near future, is called electrical impedance tomography. Electrical impedance tomography. And this is a very clever technique. Those are ECG electrodes on this uh, patient's chest. And the way this works is it sends a small current of electricity into each of these electrodes, and that signal is picked up uh, by the other 17, excuse me, 16 uh, ECG electrodes. And from these electrical impedances across the chest, you actually can create an image. And the image is down at the bottom left there. Uh, the blue images tell you what's, uh, where ventilation is going. And in this example here, uh, the lung uh, in this cross-sectional picture has been broken up into four quadrants, the left, uh, and that's up above. And the tidal changes in each of those four quadrants can be plotted, as you can see on this, uh, on, on this graphic. So this is really a pretty cool idea, and it would be available uh, almost whenever you need it at the bedside to make sure that your tidal volume, your global tidal volume, is not producing regional overdistension. I've never seen this in person, but I put the here because I think it's so cool. Uh, another way of assessing regional tidal volumes is to listen to it. Acoustical imaging, those are all little microphones there. And I think that would really be fun to put on somebody's chest and listen to all the different quadrants of the lung. And sure enough, the sound intensity can create images uh, of the lung. And this may be uh, uh, another alternative, perhaps. Having, uh, having said that, I've never actually touched this in person, and I'm not even sure it's commercially available. But I include it in my presentation here because I think it illustrates the point that we need better tools, we need better tools to assess regional behavior. Uh, we could actually measure FRC. Uh, inert gas wash-in, uh, one ventilator company actually does nitrogen washouts. So you can actually measure the functional lung. Uh, the way I think we can do it today without going to these more exotic techniques is to use what is called the driving pressure, the driving pressure. So what is the driving pressure? This is a little graph of flow, volume, airway pressure uh, uh, with a plateau hold in the middle of the plateau, in the middle of the breath, and an esophageal pressure down at the very bottom. But what I want you to really look at is the red arrow the red arrow. That is the difference between plateau pressure and PEEP. Plateau pressure and PEEP. And that is the pressure required, if you will, to drive the tidal volume into the lung. And if you think about it, that pressure is, in fact, the tidal volume divided by compliance. The tidal volume divided by compliance. And we take this a step further, we realize this is a way to scale the tidal volume, not on ideal body size, but on the actual compliance mechanics of the lung. Because compliance is not a bad surrogate, not a bad surrogate for functional lung size. So again, instead of setting tidal volume to ideal body weight, maybe we can set it to functional lung size as reflected in the compliance measurement. The plateau pressure minus the PEEP equals driving pressure equals tidal volume divided by compliance. So what's a safe, what's a safe driving pressure? Uh, I'll give you the short answer. We don't know. We don't know. 
This is a, a widely quoted study by Marcelo Amato. Uh, it is not a study looking at tidal volumes. As a matter of fact, it's a retrospective look at a bunch of studies that actually were looking at PEEP. And what he plotted, or what he was able to plot, is driving pressure from these studies because that data was available. And he plotted driving pressure versus uh, mortality. And as you can see, mortality risk starts to go up above one when the driving pressure is somewhere around 15 centimeters of water. So at the time I'm giving this presentation, uh, 15 centimeters of water seems to be uh, a reasonable threshold for the time being. But as more data are collected, uh, that recommendation may change. So an excessive driving pressure may be a very valuable tool to suggest problems. Uh, actually, actually, the driving pressure suggests two possibilities. Two possibilities. Remember, it's tidal volume divided by compliance. We've been talking about tidal volume, but it's also affected by compliance. Let's look at the tidal volume part a little bit more in detail. So an excessive regional tidal volume, despite a global normal tidal volume, uh, may uh, uh, really have different effects uh, on how much functional lung is in there, as I've been describing. Again, in panel number A, the tidal volume, six mLs per kilo, it's evenly distributed. The driving pressure in this example is only eight centimeters of water. Things are safe. In panel B, in panel B, tidal volume is again six mLs per kilo, but it's all going to that overdistended right anterior lung, and the driving pressure here is 22 centimeters of water, probably unsafe. We would leave the patient A alone. In patient B, we might strongly consider reducing the tidal volume further. And as I said, there's a second possibility here, uh, inadequate recruitment. And I'm going to come back to that point in a couple of minutes. For right now, though, I want to focus on just the issue of the tidal volume effects and driving pressure. This is an important slide. And the reason it's important is because it reminds us that there are trade-offs involved. This is the ARDS network study published in the New England Journal back in 2000, comparing the small tidal volume, 6 mL per kilo, to the large tidal volume, 12 mL per kilo strategy. And I want you to look carefully at this slide because you'll notice we're plotting P to F ratio on the vertical axis and study day on the horizontal axis. And look carefully at day number one. The dark circles, the 12 mL per kilo patients, actually had a much better PO2 FiO2 ratio. Wow. Aren't those the patients that go on to die? Yep. Yes, they are. So what's going on here? I'll tell you what I think is going on. What I think is going on is that on day one, on day one, the large tidal volume actually recruited some additional lung units actually did, opened up some lung units, and made the P to F ratio better. But you'll notice by day three, the difference has disappeared. And why has it disappeared? Because these large tidal volumes over the, over the last couple of days were actually injuring the healthier regions of the lung. It takes villi, ventilator-induced lung injury, a couple of days to develop. So these curves actually cross at day three, day four, and the high tidal volume group goes on to die. It's an interesting situation, isn't it? A fundamental disconnect between a physiologic benefit, better P to F, and an outcome result. Keep this in mind, not only for tidal volume management, but for many things we read in the literature. Be always be very careful of a physiologic benefit. I love physiology as much as you guys do. Uh, but at the same time, the price you pay for normalizing a physiologic parameter may be quite excessive, as it is in this example. So trade-offs are important to recognize. The final uh, goal is to try to minimize collapse and reopening. And how do we do that? We do that with PEEP. We do that with PEEP. This is a little uh, a depiction of alveolar behavior, the little uh, yellow uh, structures at the bottom. And in this example, they're collapsed in expiration. They inflate as you put positive pressure into the lung, and then they collapse again. And you all know as well as I do, you put a little expiratory pressure in there, 
you maintain the recruitment, and that's good. That's good. The problem is in alveoli where they are not collapsing and reopening, you may serve only to overdistend the lung, or at least those regions of the lung, and that can be very bad. Again, this balancing act we play every day in the ICU managing our ventilator patients. So how do we search for best PEEP? And again, just like we talked about before, there are a number of options. Maybe we could do CT scans. Maybe we can use EIT for this. Mechanical approaches and empirical tables. So the visual, again, uh, CT scan at the top. Uh, we put pressure into this lung. Incredible recruitable potential. You put a lot of pressure into the bottom lung, guess what? Not much recruitability and terrible, terrible over distension. So again, we're trying to balance the good effects of PEEP with the bad effects of PEEP. And here's our EIT signal again. And uh, what this is showing you is, uh, is collapse and reopening versus over distension. And as you can see, uh, as you increase the PEEP, that's what's going along the horizontal axis there, you reach a point where recruitment is maximal and over distension is minimal, and that's the sweet spot. That's the sweet spot. Again, we don't have, we don't have EIT yet, but uh, this could be a very nice tool uh, when it becomes available. A lot of people like to do mechanical things, and I like mechanics too. Uh, this is not a new idea. Uh, the panel on the left is actually a study by Peter Suter back in the mid-1970s. And what he's doing is he's adding PEEP along the horizontal axis in a series of patients with bad lung injury. And the very top panel shows that the PO2 gets better and better and better. And the second panel down shows that it getting, the shunt fraction is getting better and better and better. And the very bottom panel is actually showing oxygen delivery. So PO2, hemoglobin saturation times cardiac output. And that rises and then falls. And why does it fall? Because at very high PEEP levels, cardiac filling is compromised and oxygen delivery is compromised. And this seems to correlate with the best compliance, the third panel, where the best compliance is associated with the best oxygen delivery. So again, best PEEP is not necessarily the best PO2. Best PEEP is, in this example of Peter Suter's, the best compliance and the best oxygen delivery. Today, we like to play around uh, with pressure volume curves, and I think that's cool. The ideal pressure volume curve is the dotted line, the static pressure volume curve, curves number A and B. And these are slow, or these are uh, small uh, uh, inflations of the lung, and then you hold it for a plateau pressure, and we put down the little X there. And then you inflate it a little more and get another plateau pressure. Inflate it a little more and get another uh, plateau pressure, all the way up to the top. And then you can do the same thing coming down. You deflate and get a plateau. You deflate and get a plateau. You deflate and get a plateau all the way back down. And there's hysteresis, as you all know. The hysteresis is because as you recruit lung, mechanics get better. A lot of people like to use the dynamic curve as a surrogate for this. And I would caution against that. I would caution against that. The dynamic curve, you get breath to breath on your ventilator, uh, especially if you're going from virtual uh, no pressure uh, all the way up to maximal pressure, uh, is heavily, heavily, heavily influenced by the flow pattern, by the flow pattern. You can help that a little bit by creating a constant flow so that the flow effects on the pressure volume curve are somewhat less. And you can also compensate a little bit for it by slowing the flow down, getting it very low, as in curve number D there. And some people like to use this slow flow, slow constant flow inflation as a poor man's representation of the static inflation curve. And the theory behind doing this is that you would be uh, uh, aiming to make sure the maximal pressure is below the upper bend in that curve, the so-called upper inflection point, and that the PEEP is above the lower bend in that curve, the so-called lower inflection point. Again, I have trouble with this because uh, it's on the inflation limb. It's on the inflation limb. And in fact, once you start adding PEEP, 
the curve shifts over to the deflation limb as you recruit the lung, and, uh, uh, and your measurements uh, may not be reflecting this deflation limb very well. Because after all, it's on the deflation limb is where the uh, peep and the overdistension should be considered. So if you get the fact, if you sense that I'm a little uh, unenthusiastic about trying to measure mechanics with a dynamic loop, you're right. You're right. Let's come back to the dr driving pressure again. Uh, I already talked about the fact that an elevated driving pressure might reflect an excessive regional tidal volume. But again, remember the driving pressure is tidal volume divided by compliance, so it might also reflect under recruitment. So if you've got an excessive driving pressure, you really have two choices, don't you? You really have two choices. You can reduce the tidal volume, you can increase the peep. Which one do you do first? Flip a coin, flip a coin. What a lot of people like to do is see if there's a possibility you can lower the driving pressure by a little peep. And it's, it's very simple, trial and error. You add a little peep, and if the driving pressure gets better, you've done a good thing. If the driving pressure gets worse, you've done a bad thing. If the driving pressure doesn't change much, it's kind of a wash. So in addition to using tidal volume reductions to improve driving pressure, you can also consider trying a little extra peep to improve the driving pressure. So the driving pressure really gives you a pretty cool uh, insight into the mechanics of the lung during your tidal breath. So again, we've talked about uh, visual, we've talked about mechanical. Uh, what do we often do? What do we often do? We literally, we literally juggle three balls in the air with tables. Now you may not have a written down table in your ICU, but you got one probably up in your head. And what are you doing? You're trying to balance PO2 benefits, you're trying to balance plateau pressure uh, excessiveness, and you're trying to balance excessive FiO2 exposures. And how do you do that? You use tables. Okay, so let's look at a PEEP FiO2 table. This is, these are two PEEP FiO2 tables uh, used by the ARDS network. The original one is in orange, and you can see that the minimum uh, PEEP is five, and the minimum FiO2 is 30%, and it goes all the way up to a maximum PEEP of 24, and a maximum FiO2 of 1.0. Uh, the goal is to keep the PO2 between 55 and 80, and to keep the plateau pressure less than 30. Okay, those are your goals. So, if you're above 80, uh, you would move down a step. If you're above a plateau pressure of 30, you would move down a step. If you're below 55 and your plateau pressure is safe, you can move up a step and so on. And you go up and down this table. It's actually very easy to use and was, uh, as, as I say, quite, uh, quite uh, uh, adaptable to the ARDS network study. Now the second table here is, a black, is the black bars. And it's similar in concept, except the minimum now is 12. The minimum now is 12 centimeters of water. Uh, but similar rules and similar maximums. These two studies, or these two strategies, have been compared. The ARGENET compared them, and there were actually two additional studies that uh, were designed very similarly to compare these two approaches to PEEP and FiO2. There was the Canadian study, uh, the LOVE study, and the European study, which was the EXPRESS trial. And as you can see, the low PEEP, average low PEEP uh, in all three studies was around nine centimeters of water, and the average, high, uh, low, or the average high, high PEEP in these three studies was around 15. The good news is that the high PEEP, the high PEEP uh, improved compliance, and it improved the PDF ratio. Not surprising. But the bad news is, it also raised the plateau pressure. In fact, in the Canadian study, the average plateau pressure was 30 centimeters of water. So, here we go again. We're competing, good effects and bad effects. Who won? Who won? Well, it's really quite interesting. In the individual trials, there were no clear winners, if you will. But what was really cool is these data were pooled. They were put into a single database. And this single database was broken into two populations. 
Uh, this, this slide is in the day before the Berlin definitions. Uh, on the left are patients with ARDS. What that means is they had a PDF ratio less than 200. In the panel on the right, in the panel on the right, these were patients who were healthier, relatively speaking, of course, uh, but their PDF ratio was above 200. And I want you to look at these curves very carefully because you will notice in the sicker patients, the high peep, the high peep tables in all three studies pooled actually had a mortality benefit. Mortality benefit. And what is really neat is the flip was also true. In the healthier patients, the low PEEP table had a better outcome. That actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. In the patients who have a lot of lung injury and a lot of recruitment potential, an aggressive PEEP strategy, uh, the risk of overdistension is less than the benefit you're going to get from recruitment. But the flip side is also true. In those patients in whom there's not a whole lot of recruitable potential, the overdistension effects of aggressive PEEP outweigh any potential recruitment effects. So it actually all fits together in a nice little package. And I think the way to, that we approach it back home is we use both tables. We use both tables and we flip back and forth between the high table and the low table depending upon whether the PDF ratio is above or below 200. So it's a nice way, at least at the present time, uh, of balancing these three balls, PO2, plateau pressure, and FiO2 in a rational way that may actually have some impact on outcome. I think it's kind of interesting, this is a, a, another study done on the same data uh, a little bit later, but it's showing that the, uh, P, if the PO2 gets better with, your, with going on this table, uh, you, get, you have a better outcome. That's mortality on the vertical axis, and the change in PO2 following, following a PEEP change. So the purple line is our, excuse me, our patients in whom the PEEP table, going on the PEEP FiO2 table, required you to increase, increase the, P, uh, the PEEP. And if increasing the PEEP improved the PO2, mortality got a whole lot better. As you can see, the purple line really drops. But what I found interesting is if the PEEP, if going on the PEEP table, table told you to decrease the PEEP, decrease the PEEP, and the PO2 got better, that was a better outcome too. That was a better outcome too. So these PEEP FiO2 tables actually make some sense, at least to me, at the present time. So how are we doing in balancing FiO2 and PEEP? Well, this is pretty pathetic. This is pretty pathetic. This again is our lung safe study, and uh, uh, on, the, on, on the left is, uh, uh, is FiO2 exposure, and on the right is the PEEPs being used. And I want you to notice something very interesting. If you look at, this, at these data from around the globe, the world seems scared to death to go above a PEEP of 12. The right panel. The vast majority of patients are being ventilated with a PEEP less than 12. Well, you may say, okay, well, maybe they're just healthier people. Wrong. The reason I say it's wrong is because look at the FiO2. Clinicians around the world are willing to live with FiO2s above 60 and sometimes above 80 to keep the PEEP less than 12. And I would submit to you, based on the data I've just shown you, that this needs rethinking. This needs rethinking. The world is clearly not in sync with the PEEP FiO2 tables I have shown you. Now, some people ask um, alternative to PEEP, and the one that's often talked about, and I just want to spend a moment uh, give, giving you my take on it, is lengthening the eye time. And this little schematic here illustrates the concept. So, uh, at the bottom, we have got uh, uh, alveoli that are collapse and opening, and if we add PEEP, we go to the table on, or the figure on the upper right, uh, where we have maintained recruitment, but at the same time, we have potentially overdistended healthier regions of the lung. Lengthening the eye time, even to the point of inverse ratio ventilation, will also help maintain recruitment, 
but without necessarily over distending the healthier regions of the lung. At least this is the theory. This concept has been around for a long, long time. Uh, it has been popularized over the last decade or so by the use of a mode called airway pressure release ventilation. And APRV is basically an inverse ratio strategy. Uh, the, the difference is that patients are allowed to breathe spontaneously during the inflation period. And you can see uh, that depicted on this graphic here. The blue are the air, is the airway pressure. Very long eye time, very short E time. Uh, and there are spontaneous breaths, the little red panels, that are occurring uh, not all, or during the inflation period. So this, in theory, uh, seems to be addressing the ideal uh, IRV or inverse ratio uh, concept I showed you just a moment ago. But there are some landmines here. There are some landmines here. First off, I want you to notice uh, that these spontaneous breaths occurring at the top of the inflation period will add to the tidal volume, will add to the tidal uh, strain on the lungs. So even though you have a set pressure of 20 and a delivered volume of uh, 7 mLs per kilogram, the transpulmonary pressure, if you take into account these spontaneous breaths, and the ultimate tidal volume, if you take into account the spontaneous efforts, uh, can be uh, in violation of our uh, concepts of safe ventilation. Another thing about APRV that a lot of people don't recognize is that uh, it causes air trapping. You can see with the red uh, uh, expiratory flow pattern that the lungs are not coming back to zero flow during the deflation period, the classic sign of air trapping. In essence, you are replacing applied PEEP with intrinsic PEEP. Is that good or bad? Well, we're not really sure, but I would submit to you that intrinsic PEEP, intrinsic PEEP is going to build up in areas with bad airway resistance, and it is going to uh, not be very prevalent in patients or in lungs that are really stiff with wide open airways. And those are the units, after all, you'd like to have PEEP being applied to. So intrinsic PEEP, at least in theory, may not be the ideal way to keep the lung recruited. At the end of the day, uh, APRV is yet to be shown to improve outcomes. I know it's a popular mode that people go to when they have severely hypoxemic patients, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just saying understand what's going on and be honest with yourself that outcome studies supporting its application still have not uh, uh, been uh, uh, published. So let's sort of summarize where we are kind of at the present time. Safe and effective ventilator settings. Basically, is our PO2 between 55 and 80? Is our pH above 7.15? Is our maximal strain uh, uh, kept low, a plateau pressure less than 30, uh, hopefully reflecting a transpulmonary pressure less than 30? Is the tidal volume less than 8 mLs per kilo? And uh, is the driving pressure at least below 15, some might argue 19, and are we on a proper PEEP FiO2 table? These are sort of the rules of the road, I think, in modern management of mechanical ventilators. Before I close, I want to go through one final uh, concept that I find kind of fun. It's called the stress index. The stress index. And what's the stress index? It's essentially the pressure volume relationship during the breath. So you've already set up a tidal volume, you've already set up a PEEP, and now you're looking at the pressure volume relationships of that tidal breath at that PEEP. If it, it is measured by using a constant flow and it has to be a passive patient. So it has to be a volume targeted breath with a constant flow so that effects of flow are not impacting the airway pressure profile. And if you do it properly with a constant flow and a passive patient, the ideally, if you've got properly recruited lungs and you're not over distending, the curve, the airway pressure curve, should be a straight diagonal. Straight diagonal. And that slope of that pressure profile is the stress index. So what is the stress index? It's taking the pressure volume curve and turning it on its side turning it on its side. 
And because it's a constant flow, volume and time are uh, interchangeable. And as you can see, it's measuring the change in pressure over the inspiratory time. And it's taking into account of the peep you've set and the tidal volume you've set. So these are three possibilities. These are three possibilities. If you've set the patient too low, inadequate peep, what's going to happen? The pressure profile will go steep as the lung is recruited and then flatten out when recruitment is finished. So you get a curve, a pressure curve that's shaped like that. And on the far right, you've got the reverse. Now you've got the patient set too high in terms of PEEP and tidal volume or tidal volume, and the curve starts to bend upward. And like Goldilocks, uh, right in the middle is where you want to be. Right in the middle is where you want to be, the so-called sweet spot, where the pressure profile is a straight diagonal. So in a, a nice little graphic form, this is Marco Ranieri's uh, uh, original work on this. Uh, and what he's showing that if the curve is bent like that, uh, if, it, if it's bent, it's steep to begin with and then flattens out, um, that indicates you need more recruitment. And if it's sloping upward, that means you've got too much volume or pressure in the system. And of course, right in the middle is the sweet spot where you're not over distending and you're not under recruiting. These are some nice studies uh, I did with my good buddy John Davies a few years ago, looking at PEEP, three different levels of PEEP in an animal model, and it's illustrating exactly what I'm showing you. You'll notice at the top where we are under PEEPed, you will notice the pressure waveform starts up and then becomes, a, sort of flattens out. If the PEEP is correct at 15 in this example, it's a nice straight diagonal pressure profile, and if we are over descending with an excessive PEEP, you can see the pressure waveform curves upward. So let's add to my table for safe and effective uh, ventilator management. Again, these are the questions I like to ask at the bedside of every ventilated patient I'm taking care of. Are my ABG targets on target? Is my maximal strain minimal? Again, a plateau pressure of 30, uh, taking into account any effects a chest wall might have. Is the tidal volume less than eight mLs per kilo? And fine tune that with a stress index or a driving pressure. And finally, is the PEEP and FiO2 balanced on a table? And again, fine tune this with the stress index or the driving pressure. So this is where I think mechanical ventilation is today. And uh, it's the way I try to round on my ventilators back home. And it's the way I try to teach fellows, residents and the like and my respiratory therapists have heard me preach this for a while, and they've gotten really good at uh, addressing these things and teaching these things. So let me summarize and conclude. Uh, I have tried to review the mechanisms of injury, over distension, excessive tidal strain, collapse and reopening, and that these are quite regional. These are quite regional. Our goals are to address these three major mechanisms of injury, limit excessive maximal set, stretch, limit excessive tidal stretch, and minimize collapse and reopening. So thank you all for uh, joining us today in this, uh, in, in this session. Uh, hopefully you uh, have a little better understanding of uh, uh, a, a logical way to approach and round on your mechanically ventilated patients. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.